Welcome back, everyone, to That Amazon Ads podcast, where today we have a very special guest, Emma Shermer-Tamir, who is an advanced copywriting strategist. And that is going to be what today's episode is all about, is talking about copywriting in Amazon. Obviously, that's important, especially as it's it's t- tying into your SEO, it's tying into your product ad quality score, all these things that are going to be contributing to ranking. But at the same time, you're trying to tell a message, tell your story to customers, and communicate something effectively to them. So we're excited to dive into this topic. And Emma, how are you doing today? I am doing fantastically. I am under an atmospheric river right now here in Vegas. So I don't know if you're also experiencing that in California. But aside from that, I'm doing splendidly. I've never heard it described as an atmospheric river. That's a new one, <laughs> but, for sure. Yeah, I think that's but, what they're calling it. Okay. That's just a way to say basically like rain. It's a raining. lot of rain. from. <laughs> it's a river from the sky. Yes, <laughs> they're just not. They're just not used to it out there on the West Coast. We get that. We get that rain here in uh, Nashville all the time. So yeah. you guys just aren't built for it. I don't know. I don't think this so. is just meteorological <laughs> copywriting, essentially. You know, right. a new way to hook people into exactly paying attention exactly. to the news. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we are getting some rain. Love it's it. very nice and and cozy out here today. So it's it's an excellent day to podcast in a warm room. So. But, but Emma, why don't you tell everyone really quickly a little bit more about what you do? I, I didn't really go into too much detail on the introduction because I wanted to leave that up to you. But yeah, why don't you just let everyone know? And then Andrew and I have got a list of questions here and we'll just start kind of putting you on the hot seat and firing away. Absolutely. So we help brands in competitive categories really tap into who their ideal customers are and help them convert better and build fan bases and create businesses with staying power, which is pretty tricky to do on a platform like Amazon because you always have a million different people vying for the exact same customers. The rules are always changing. The fees are always increasing. There are just so many different elements at play that it's almost like it boils down and condenses all of the things that you have to do effectively in any kind of business. And it really makes them even more critical if you want to actually be able to have a profitable business. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, So you're working with a lot of different brands, a lot of categories, and, and essentially helping them improve their conversion rates, improve their overall presence on the platform, tell their brand story and, and depict that image of the brand that they're trying to create as well as just mixing in the the different components that you know drive conversions on detail pages like what what are those different levers we can pull on the detail page that are going to influence a customer in the right way to help guide the decision to purchasing the product which is what we're ultimately trying to do on Amazon is drive those purchases drive those sales and we have a lot of different areas that we can focus on to to kind of move the needle towards driving more sales I'm curious, Emma, with your background and in, in working in, in convert, uh, design and, and branding and, and all these uh, listing optimizations and things like that, what would you say is, what are like the main psychological components that go into a really effective Amazon PDP? What are those main things that you're looking for that make the biggest impact with some of these clients that you're working with in these more competitive spaces where, you know, there may you may already have kind of checked the boxes and, and hit you know, I got A plus content, I got main images, I got a title. What else? What else can we do um, from like a more psychological perspective to help, uh, you know, be more influential with the copy that we have, the images that we have on our PDPs? Excellent question. My mind is already ping ponging in a few different places. So a few thoughts that immediately come to mind is one is that you really have to understand the emotional driver behind why someone is going on to Amazon in the first place and looking for a product like yours. And you need to be reflecting that through every piece of your product page. So a lot of times people are thinking a little bit more granularly and they're thinking about that maybe from the SEO perspective, obviously that's why we choose to do our keyword research and integrate those keywords into the content. But you also need to be reflecting that through the copy and through the imagery that you're using. And they should all really be driving home the fact that this product is going to not only solve that need, but really help to elevate that person's experience in the world, be it through solving a problem, through making their lives better, 
whatever it may be. And kind of along that same line is you also really need to understand who your customers are and you need to reflect that in your content. So if you are selling to a specific demographic who dresses a certain way or is interested in a certain set of things, then you need to make sure that your language and your imagery are also showing versions of those customers to them. So let's say that you are selling uh, athletic leggings and you are selling them to people who are um, who do yoga but are also rock climbers. I don't know where I'm coming up with this example, but let's just say that, that the, you know they're 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 stretchy and comfy for yoga class, but they're rugged enough to take into the back country and be climbing and you're not going to destroy them uh, as you're scaling rock surfaces. Well, you want to make sure that you are showing images of people in both of those contexts, but you also want to think about what does a climber look like and what does a climber wear? And if you're having somebody that's very done up or you know that maybe doesn't have those calloused hands or isn't wear wearing that special gear, it's going to feel contrived and it's going to feel out of place. Or you're selling something and you're really talking about body inclusivity, but then you have all of your models who are a size zero and who are just one version of a, a body shape and size. So you really need to be making sure that you are mirroring your customers back to them through all of these things because ultimately we all care about ourselves first and foremost, more than anything else. And people can very easily get into a trap when they are putting together anything that's talking about their brand because the initial sort of um, impulse is to talk about how great you are, but customers don't know you yet. Customers don't care about how great you are. Customers care about the problem that they have and they want to know that you are going to be a reliable brand to help them solve that. So those are just a couple of the things I could go on and on for two more hours if you'd like me to, but <laughs> no, we know you could. <laughs> we know you could. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I really like that example uh, of the yoga rock climbing pants. I'm not sure if those if that actually exists as a product, but it certainly should. I'm sure there's like a pretty good sized market for that. And I was imagining someone doing oh, like really? yoga poses on like the side of a mountain, just hanging off. Ooh. In like yeah, a, I mean, I maybe <laughs> downward you know, dog. Some, someone listening needs to do the research to see if, if there's a a gap in the market. You already sold me on it. Just trying to cast <laughs> the vision of what this would be. So it's you, you're making loves that wearing connection. yoga pants. <laughs> yeah, I do. Oh, same, all the time. Right? <laughs> it's not true. All the time. Not true. <laughs> no judgment. But that's also that's that actually speaks to another very important psychological component, which is that you need to have something that is differentiating you and giving people a reason to choose you. And too often brands are just leaning into price or reviews, which are not the mm. most defensible of differentiation levers that you have. And so whether it's how you're positioning yourself to an untapped customer base or through a certain set of values, you do need something unique that is going to make customers want to select your particular yoga pants from the thousand other yoga pants that they could be yes. buying on Amazon. Yes. Now, Emma, this, you and I connect, this this brings me to another section that we wanted to talk about. And you and I had seen, I forget if it was a week ago or two weeks ago, just to kind of like get introduced to each other. And we started having some really interesting conversations that I had to cut off. And I said, hey, don't say any more. Like, what <laughs> I don't want to waste all these good thoughts that are coming out. Let's wait till we get the, the mics out so that everyone can hear it. But on that topic of brand differentiation, we were talking about how especially I think one of the biggest uphill battles that a lot of brands are facing is the commoditization of their industries. That they had a really good product, they were a good price point, really good reviews, and those spaces just became inundated with you know 10x or 100x the amount of competition a lot of products from overseas that are coming in with a better price point and still have a ton of reviews. And you were using the example, or we started talking about brand differentiation brand <laughs> differentiation as the biggest way to set yourself apart from the pack. And 
you gave the example of like water bottle industry. Like if someone's going to try to tap into water bottles, how are you possibly going to make yourself look different? It sounds like the worst industry to get into. And yet we have the brand Liquid Death that just came and took the water bottle market by storm, uh, which I thought was really interesting. So why don't we switch gears to that really quick and you can share a bit more of some of what you started talking about with Liquid Death and how that differentiation started basically allowing them to win. <laughs> yeah, it's it. Liquid Death is an example. Also boxed water. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's another one that's sort of really? figuring Doesn't out. Doesn't sound uh, good. You, <laughs> they call themselves boxed water is better. And so they're in, uh, what do you call that? Like a carton? Like special. A, it's a carton, but it's yeah, like it's some like special milk. kind of carton that's recyclable. Like carton. And yeah. It's not, uh, you know, it's it's not plastic. So it's supposed to have a less, in, you know, a, a weaker negative impact on the mm -hmm. environment. Anyway, that's getting off <clears> on sure. a tangent. Let's, let's focus on liquid death, which... Liquid Death is an anomaly. Let's like also put that out there. They had a lot of money and a lot of ability to do things that is going to be much harder to do if you are just starting off, but not impossible. And so they can serve as a great example of how to think about what you need to do in almost any space, especially if you do not have something innovative and unique about your product. And so that's why we were talking about liquid death is this is essentially a commodity. There's really nothing that you can do to water that is going to make it a revolutionary product. We have mm -hmm. all the things, you know, we have the pH and the al al whether it's alkaline or if it's infused with electrolytes and minerals with like, like a smart water, we have all of those things. But one of the things that didn't exist on the market was a water that people like, you know, drummers on stage and very um, masculine energy people could confidently drink in a bar type of setting. And that was one of the areas where Liquid Death was able to come in and really innovate. And so uh, I, I wish I remembered who it was, but there was somebody that was talking about they're a drummer, they're on stage all the time. You know, drummers are burning a lot of calories and sweating a lot. This is a full body workout that they're doing to put on a whole show. And most of the time, the sponsorships were either energy drinks or alcohol, which it's not really in anybody's best interest to be smashing energy drinks for a two hour set. And if you're not a drinker, then what are you to do? If you have your just a regular water bottle there, people might not take you as seriously. And so this liquid death, when you see it, you could easily mistake it for a Guinness or some other more beer type of product but it's actually a water. And they didn't just do that with how they designed the bottle or the can itself. They also have really thought about all of the language that goes into it. So what is their tagline? Murder your thirst. Like they're, mm -hmm. they are all in, they're very deliberate with who they are, who their customers are, how they're positioning themselves. You know, they have people like Steve-O who are brand brand ambassadors, I suppose, for for their company, doing all sorts of wild and crazy stunts for Liquid Death. Uh, and, and so they're really not just about the water, they're really creating this whole culture and movement around what they're doing. And now they're, um, I don't remember how many billions of dollars valuation, and it's in a space like water. Yeah, which it's pretty just wild. <laughs> yeah, it was all through just, I mean, you know, branding basically, and and copywriting, yeah. right? The with first of all, just coming up with like the title of the product, but then also, uh, you know, those those marketing lines, murder your thirst. So that's pretty wild. Yeah, I and mean, then, it's like a, a melting skull is their uh, yeah. it, is their logo. You know, I mean, they they are intentionally pushing a lot of traditional expectations around what you would expect to see with something like a water company. So we're not talking about 
the the essence of life or the right you know yeah it, it it's reimagining what the conversation can look like around right. something as basic as water it was so polar opposite to everything yeah that was when i first saw a liquid death can in in the store i was like who is their target audience people who are going to be paying money for water are usually like really into healthy like they're very you know, pro living, like not death, <laughs> like, you know, like who was marketing death towards people who are most likely to drink water. But yeah, it, there was an audience there. So that was, that was uh, very, very unique that they found that. But then, you know, on, on something like murder your thirst and these types of like really creative uh, copy that you can write, there is kind of a balance. This is something else we, we would have been chatting about a little bit but there's a balance between trying to write for humans, writing that emotional language, something really catchy. But at the same time, all of this text, whether it's in your titles or your headlines, is being indexed by these search algorithms. And so you also have to play into a little bit of like an SEO value. And you have to try to find that balance between writing for machines versus writing for humans. And I think you actually might have said, Emma, that you, I think you were making a video or you already have a video on this on your own YouTube channel where you go really in depth. Is Am I remembering correctly? Yeah, you're right. I have a, a video that talks all about how to effectively integrate keywords into your copy because you're absolutely right. That in particular is a pretty challenging thing to do. I think it will be changing a lot as we get more and more into the world of generative search, which is probably mm -hmm. going to turn a lot of traditional SEO conventions on their head or make them totally irrelevant. But we're not sure. there yet. So for the time being, you still need to understand how to be able to work in those search terms in your copy in a way that is going to signal to customers that this is what they were searching for, but also not go so far in the other direction that this is just very clearly a keyword and nothing more. Um, so that's definitely one piece of that. But then you also were talking about this balance of needing to be both clear and not necessarily too clever. And and that can be really challenging to do. And a lot of that also has to do with being clear about what you're writing for. So not all copy ha has to do the same job. So the copy that's going to be on an ad that's meant to drive somebody to a product page is even going to be a different type of pro of copy than what's going to be on an ad that's more about upper funnel awareness and brand building. And then that's going to be different copy than what's actually within the product page. And also, even when you get to what's within the product page, different parts of that are going to serve different functions. And so thinking about copy in two narrow of a of a container is going to put some artificial rules in place that may actually hinder your performance for the specifics of what it is that you're actually writing for. So you always need to be thinking about what in what situation is the customer going to be encountering this copy? And then mm -hmm. what is the job of this copy in that situation? And what am I actually trying to get the customer to do? And so that's going to very strongly inform the approach you take and whether you're going to be a little bit more clever or whether you need to be more straightforward and deliberate in just a very clear uh, call to action. Um, but without that contextual information, you're going to really be missing out on getting deep into the nuance of making copy effective for every single place that you're using it. Yeah, that's yeah. absolutely brilliant. I, I, I think the um, that's something I haven't considered a lot, the changing the messaging between whether it's top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel. And for our listening audience, if you caught the episode just before this one where we were talking about different cost types, different tactics, uh, whether you're paying for impressions or paying for clicks, that's a great example where if you are using a, a CPM model where your goal is to drive that brand awareness uh, and really just just get the impressions out there, get some visits to the product pages, but you're not so focused on conversion, having that really compelling, uh, intriguing 
copy that just captures attention and captures imagination is really good. But then you start working your way down the funnel towards some more conversion based tactics. And now you're, you know, you're going after long tail keywords in uh, search and really just going after the sponsor brand top of search placements there you probably want to be a bit more dialed down to the point keyword focus. So that's that's a really, really good point of, of advice and information. Yeah, I mean, great copy can simultaneously drive a sale or get in the way of a sale. If you're overcomplicating things at the point of where somebody just wants to give you money, then that could actually be going against you. Right. You know, you always exactly. want to make sure that uh, and where whatever stage you're in, that you're also always thinking about ease of comprehension, because that's one of those places, especially when we're talking about copy, where people can frequently get in their own way. Um, and, and overall, anytime that you're creating a point of friction, that's that's where you're going to start losing people. That's where they're going to start clicking into a competitor's listing or deciding that this is just they don't have the energy to make a decision about the product to buy right now, or maybe they'll just add five to cart, but then never get around to actually pulling the trigger on things. And so if you're not really emphasizing clarity in most of your messaging, you're going to be missing out on sales opportunities. Like I would even argue that something like murder your thirst used in, a, in the wrong context would be detrimental to liquid death's performance. It has a place and it's really strong, but at the point of of especially like the early discovery and whatnot, that could confuse people in a way that it's not immediately clear. It also doesn't necessarily roll off your tongue, like it almost gets stuck there a little bit where mm -hmm. it's like, did I read that correctly? So just some different things to keep in mind. That's also where obviously testing can be really important um, and and also going back to who your customers are. Some customers may benefit from more um, like higher term higher level terminology. Like if we're going back to our imaginary hiking yoga or climbing yoga pants, if you're targeting avid climbers, you you want to use language that climbers use when they are out doing their climbing activities. And so if you're trying to go too simplistic with that, then you might actually turn people away because you are not using the language that a climber would use. And thus you are signaling to them that perhaps you are not one of them. Perhaps you don't get them. Then what does that mean? Maybe these pants aren't going to hold up when they're out all day uh, climbing and scaling rocks or what have you. So it's all those little things that may not seem like a big deal, but can actually have a lot happening in the customer's brain in a short amount of time that could just send them elsewhere. Yep, absolutely. I mean, it, it sounds like it's boiling down to, in some cases, at least in the liquid death scenario, and then also this, this uh, rock climbing yoga pants example, knowing who that ICP is, knowing who that ideal customer profile is and what that avatar looks like and who it is, what types of desires they have, what types of pain points you're solving, breaking down all those things and really getting acquainted with who am I selling this to in the first place and what are they looking for? What do they? What problem are they trying to solve? All of this is super important. So um, with Liquid Death, they knew their ideal customer profile. They narrowed that niche down so far that they were able to take a commoditized product and put a spin on it. And you'll see this a lot. Like this has been happening with a lot of like legacy industries like water um, that's been around for a long time. It's like these new competitors are coming in because they're able to put that twist on it through the branding, through the marketing and the messaging that speaks directly to a specific type of person and is compelling to that person because it's so relevant and so in touch with who they actually are and like what they, what they think internally and all that type of stuff. So I'm curious um, from your perspective, what are some of those strategies for you that you use to really get acquainted with that ICP? Who is that customer? What are some different avenues you're looking at that could potentially lead you to figuring out even more closely who the customer that is actually purchasing the product is? 
This is such an important call out that you're making. And I think that people want to rush this process and they want to skip past all of this research or they'll do just some very preliminary work here and then very quickly move on to, okay, how can we drive more traffic and how can we do this, that, and the other. But taking the time to focus on this has such a significant impact on how every other part of your strategy is going to play out. And so what do, what can you do to get more insight who your customers are? And especially like what if you're launching a new brand and you don't have customers yet? That can be a pretty intimidating or confusing place to be. And so some people will just guess, but that's can be a a pretty expensive guess to make. So what can you do? One, we have a beautiful world of social media that exists. And so much of social media is essentially just being able to tap in to the minds of your customers. And like truly, they will say what they love, what they hate, what they care about, what they're stressed about, what they wish they could see in a product, how the kind of language that they use to describe the product. So if you are not spending time observing your target customers on TikTok, on Facebook, on Instagram, in Reddit threads, if you are not lurking in all of those places, you are really missing out on not only an opportunity to get directly from your customers what they want to see in a product or a brand, but also the way that they communicate all of, about all of those things. So like an example of this would be um, makeup. One of the ways that people describe the texture of powder products is they say it's buttery. Now, if you are not in the makeup world, you would probably never consider describing a dry powder as buttery, and you wouldn't even necessarily consider that to be a positive descriptor for something that's beauty-based. However, if that is relevant to your product, you probably want to use that descriptor somewhere because that's going to be, again, that mirroring to customers that you understand their world and you're giving them what they're looking for. So they'll show you the language to use. They'll also show you the other things that they care about. So it's important to not be too narrow minded on only thinking just about your product, but you really want to get a sense of your customer's world beyond their product as well. So what are the things that they care about? Who are the influencers that they follow? What are the shows that they watch? And then that will be able to inform the kinds of jokes that you may want to make or the other types of um, maybe like when you're even putting together your own social media strategy, what are the references that you'll make? What are the people that you want to be sure to communicate with? So this is something that's going to impact a lot of different areas beyond just how you position your product, but really then once you start uh, engaging and in these different spaces. So do not underestimate or overlook the impact of, of social media for this step. Um, and another couple of tools that are great, AI does a pretty great job of giving you a really thorough customer avatar profile if, you're, if you prompt it correctly. So whether you're using ChatGPT or Claude or I think Bard just rebranded to some, something else if I'm not mistaken, but any of those, they can all do a pretty compelling job uh, reviewing your, I, I think that we've all heard this before, but your competitors reviews are another gold mine of customer insights that can be really valuable. Again, it's that hearing it directly from the customer, which is just very powerful. Um, all of this research is going to give you different insights to things, your keyword research also. I mean, where are those untapped opportunities? Are there certain keywords that a lot of people are searching where there's not a lot of competition that could actually help you shape a strategy around that's not just about driving traffic, but that is maybe speaking to a segment of people. Like maybe that's how you discover that there are a lot of rock climbers that want leggings that they can do yoga and rock climbing in. Uh, so 
So all of these areas are all incredibly important. And you also want to continue to go back to these spaces. So you don't want to just do this once in your initial market research and then forget it. You want to be regularly present in all of these places to make sure that you are staying up to date on what people care about now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For our listening audience, if for the last like three to five minutes while Emma was talking, if there weren't like a million light bulbs going off in your head of like different ideas and things you're going to go home and do after listening to this, rewind it like five minutes and listen to all that again. Cause that was pure gold. That's something that I'm going to, I'm, I definitely need to do a lot more of that. I know Andrew and I have talked in the past about, uh, stealing from customer reviews, but the way you worded all of it, Emma, just, it made, it made everything click so much more. Cause I was familiar with those concepts around like using the language of the customers, but you just, you had some really good ideas and ways of wording it that just made a bunch of things click for me at least. Yep. Absolutely. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. I almost treat copywriting and the preparation that goes into it as if you are preparing to assume a role as an actor. And Mm. Mm. when an actor gets ready for a role, they do a ton of research. I don't know if if you're not familiar with the acting world, then you might not be aware of that. But really skillful actors they will do extensive research into the psychological profile of the character they're playing into the into like all of the different interests that they have and the better that they do at that the more compelling that they are able to be as an actor because they're able to tap in with those deeper emotions behind the sometimes inexplicable choices that people are making and this is also really helpful when who you're selling to is not necessarily a customer group that you relate to, because sometimes that can be really challenging. You understand that there's a market there and you want to sell to that market and you know that you have something valuable for them, but you don't necessarily align um, ideologically on certain things. But if you go deeper, then you're actually going to connect into those emotions behind why they're doing the things that they're doing and caring about the things that they're caring. And those are actually always things that we're able to connect with as people, not to get too philosophical and deep on this, but it can really help you overcome some of those hurdles that can make it very challenging to sell to different types of customer bases. So it's, it is just, If it wasn't already clear enough, doing this research is so, so important. And it is what separates out some, a brand like a a liquid death from the rest of the herd. Yeah. I think on the one hand, it is kind of encouraging because for those who are just like, man, I'm not a good writer. Like I'm not a good writer. The work's done for you. You know, the other people have already made their writing. So on the one hand, it should be encouraging that you don't have to be a really good writer. You just have to you just have to put the time in. You just have to, you know, read and research. The words are already there. You just got to piece them together, you know. But um, when you were talking about, I, re- I really like the analogy of of acting too um, and trying to step into that persona. But it, it also made me think that just yesterday I saw this interview clip with uh, Tom Holland. And he was saying that he he memorizes when he's like, you know, doing his like movies he memorizes his lines the day of the shooting. Like he memorizes his lines like as he's putting on his, getting his makeup done, which is kind of astonishing that you could memorize like however many hours of content in that short of a time. But he says the way in which he does it is simply put, he says every line and every single line that he's ever going to deliver, he's either going to be asking a question, answering a question or telling a story. And he says when he, when he breaks it down into like everything I say is doing one of these, accomplishing one of these three things, I think that's, uh, you know, really interesting. And, and to try to pull this back into copywriting, I was wondering if you would agree, because I just made this up now, uh, if with, with particularly with headlines, when writing a headline um, and trying to create a really good catchy headline, I wonder if that would be a good way to phrase it or to or good guidelines. So you do your research, you look at customer reviews, you pull in some like, you know, you pull in a combination of like some keywords from your SEO research, a couple of good like emotional words from customer reviews and their social media. And then you combine it together into a format where you're either asking a question, answering a question, telling a story. And before I let you answer, uh, I pulled up a couple of quick examples just to see. And I looked up Dollar Shave Club and their headlines says, 
want a buttery smooth shave? Look no further. And so there they're kind of both asking and answering a question. Maybe buttery smooth came from a customer review. I'm not sure. But then I looked it up Old came Spice. Came from you, I think. <laughs> Me? I didn't, I didn't know. No, 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 Emma, oh, oh, Emma, Emma was oh, talking Emma, about yeah, yeah, yeah. buttery smooth makeup earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, they, they, someone jumped up. Someone was listening to this live and was like, fix it. <laughs> Everybody just wants butter, I guess, is the... That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Old Spice has such phenomenal marketing uh, in general, I think. And I looked up what they're doing. I typed in Old Spice to Amazon and their headline is, Shop Old Spice Total Body Deodorant. <laughs> Blah. Whoever's managing their Amazon ads uh, clearly isn't doing a good job. That's just a, that's a boring. That's such a boring. Shop Old Spice Total Body Deodorant. That's horrible. That's a horrible headline. So, anyways, I said a lot there, Eva. Curious to hear your it's, thoughts. I mean, just 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 specifically focus for a brief moment on the Old Spice ad that you just read. There's a lack of alignment there as well, mm -hmm. which is also problematic because anybody that has encountered Old Spice marketing understands that they have a very distinct mm -hmm. persona as a brand themselves and the way right. that they interact with their customers. And so in some ways, it's both kind of assuming that they don't have to try hard, which is... Right. Frankly, insulting to customers, I think. But it's also just um it it's failing to paint that full picture or going back to what you were talking about, telling that story. And every single touch point that we have is contributing to the story that we're telling, whether it is actively contributing to the storyline itself or just building out that sense of who we are as a brand and who our customers are. And so lastly, that's also a great example of how, in spite of how successful a lot of these big brands are, there is still opportunity for other companies to st steal significant market share on places like Amazon because they these large companies are so often just phoning it in. Like they're yeah. assuming that they don't have to try because they're they are Old Spice. Uh, I realized that you had the question, is the question the every piece of copy should ask a question, answer a question, or tell yeah, a story? Yeah, I was, was, I was wondering, yeah, your, your thoughts on that concept. In some ways, isn't that almost any piece of communication that we have? I know, I know. It kind of is, except for, um, I think the tell a story part isn't always, I mean, I think tell a story is probably the broadest, most vaguest descriptor like i think what what we just saw in the old spice example of just shop old spice uh total body deodorant i don't think that's like that's not a story right there's there's nothing there right and that's typically what i see a lot of a lot of times a, a lot of times like if i'm iphone charger this just says m5 iphone charger cable is the headline that's what i see most of the time these headlines are just the keyword and like there's nothing i mean the, the bar is so low <laughs> sometimes i would write that actually charges because how many times do you buy a non-apple charger that yeah, doesn't yeah that's it? great yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's phenomenal. i mean not really, really but that's not <laughs> i wouldn't i would probably use something better than that but that would be my first instinct was will this actually charge my iphone yeah i'm gonna try to reach out to the old spice marketing team and see if they need help managing their amazon ads yeah, I think you should. should. <laughs> yeah, you should. I mean, it sounds like this, like in that example, it's like Old Spice has its image already created through all of the other media and, and everything they've already done. Um, when it comes to like marketing differentiators, like what differentiates your brand from another one, there's actually only like a handful of things that actually differentiate you and everything else is kind of an extension of what those differentiators are. So basically, usually a brand is gonna be differentiated in like one or two, maybe three different categories of these differentiators and everything else needs to kind of tie back in to that overarching image, that overarching um, brand image that's been created, the story that's been created around that. So it seems like this example, Old Spice, this, this headline is not in alignment with the overarching brand messaging image right. that is trying to be created it's it's out of alignment it's not like in you know in uh accordance with what they've previously done and so it might not be as effective and, and definitely doesn't paint the brand in the same image in the same light with the same with the same influence that maybe it has whenever they're really on brand and speaking that 
specific languaging and sticking to like what actually made Old Spice Old Spice. Um, and I'm curious to hear, you know, from you, Emma, like when you when it comes to like differentiating your brand, you, you talked about a lot of different things like, um, you know, look how, how you're going about looking at all those different things. Um, do you see like, you know, kind of this this overarching uh, trend of like there's there's only so many differentiators that you can have as a brand. And then like, how do you figure out like which ones those are, which ones you kind of fit into? Is there, do you have any sort of like tactical examples? Like maybe tell us a little bit about your process for kind of how you're thinking through um, crafting compelling copy that is in alignment with that overarching brand messaging and image that's already been created. Yeah. Um, so I would say, first of all, we talked about the customer side and that's very important, but you also need to make sure that you understand who your brand is that you're building. And so Old Spice most of the time is doing an effective job of that because we all have a clear idea of who, obviously Old Spice isn't a real person, but who Old Spice is and how that brand exists in the world. and. Ultimately, that is a very important piece of the differentiation. And that's where you have a little bit more influence over also personal choice. So if you feel all the time we hear this, you know, why are you doing this? What is your overarching why as a business owner? And that can feel, frankly, pretty disconnected from a lot of the behaviors that we have at any given time. Like it's a cool concept, but it sometimes just feels a little bit too theoretical for the day to day of what a business is doing. And your brand identity and and being clear about what your values are and some of those things are actually where you're able to make all of that a bit more tangible. And I'm going to use another example to communicate what I mean. So I don't, this is an example that I use a lot because I just, I think that they do such a, a standout job of that. So I don't know if you're familiar with Black Rifle Coffee Company, but they're another company like Liquid Death that uh, is entering into this essentially commodified market this time of coffee. And they're not trying to innovate on the beans because there's really no innovation that can be done on coffee beans. You know, of course, you can have different roasts and they can be from different countries and and whatnot, but there's not much beyond that that you can do to differentiate the product itself. So Black Rifle Coffee Company is a coffee company that is uh, veteran owned and they're very proudly uh, supporting the military and law enforcement and you see that reinforced through everything from the packaging design to the names of their different blends, to the name of the brand itself, to the way that they are engaging and communicating about things with their customers in a way that actually what they're selling just happens to be coffee, but they could actually be selling anything else and probably still build a successful business by upholding these values, by being clear about who they are and by targeting a group of customers that are very interested in buying that. And so they've done that work. They've done that work of who their customers are and they've done that work of who they are. And they have established a clear line of communication between those two that also draws a line in the sand that's an us versus them. And that can actually, like a brand enemy can also be a really effective branding tool that we don't hear people talking about a lot. So almost like, um, you know, if we're, if we're going back to this concept of story, you have the villain and that us versus them taps into something very primal as humans that you can leverage um, quite effectively. And so they're clear on who we are, who we are as like either Black Rifle or supporters of Black Rifle. And they're also very clear on who their enemies are or who who they're not for. And they're not uh-huh. afraid of ruffling feathers. They're not afraid of turning customers away. And so one of the things that you really need to be doing if you want to be positioning yourself well, and Liquid Death is doing this also, is you need to be clear about who you are not trying to sell to. There should be 
if you really want to lean into this and if you really want to tap into that raving fan base, which not all companies are doing and maybe not all companies want to do, but if you really want to do that, then you also have to be pretty deliberate in turning people away and being okay with that. And that that's going to simultaneously, um, while you're turning people away, strengthening that relationship with your core customer base to create more repeat business and a stronger relationship there. And there's probably also more flexibility to be able to do this with something that is a repeat purchase, like a coffee or a water. You know, it's worthwhile to invest in those long-term relationships because this isn't a one-time transaction. This is something that ideally people are going to be buying with a frequency. And so really working to get that lifetime customer value up is super important to the success of the business. Yeah, I love that. I like that point about the brand enemy. That's that's pretty interesting. Like, and and it sounds like you're just like narrowly focusing out who you're calling out, and then by calling the right person out, you're basically excluding these other people. Maybe ruffle some feathers there and whatnot. But um, I really like that. That's really good. Um, and just to kind of pull it all back around, I feel like I didn't do a very good job explaining like those marketing differentiators ahead of time. But I want to give this to people because I've been I've been thinking about it for a long time. But you know, brands usually have, like I said, just like one or two main things that they're really strong at. And it's kind of like the focal point of all their marketing. So I just wanted to give like a couple examples of, of what that would actually look like. So for example, the marketing differentiators, I have my phone, wrote them down. Uh, we have price, beauty, technology, quality, convenience, customization, environmental slash sustainability, community. And then there's maybe a couple more, but um, for the first one, price, I think of Walmart, like Walmart's branding is like everyday low price. Everything's about like how you get a better deal, you get a discount. When you go to Walmart, you save money. Whenever you talk to people, they like going to Walmart because it's cheaper than going everywhere else, right? So that's like their big differentiator. Another example would be like beauty. Apple is a company that sells beauty. If you look at any of their marketing, any of their advertising, their website, their products themselves, they are just beautiful. They feel beautiful. They look beautiful. It's compelling. It looks great on their website and all that type of stuff. So yeah, anyway, just what are your thoughts there around those kind of core marketing differentiators? Is this something that you're like actively thinking through, analyzing with these different brands that you're working with? And then, you know, how's that extrapolate down to writing a headline for a sponsored brand ad? Yeah, not only are are there only a few that you can really focus on, but interestingly, if you lean into the ones that you are focusing on, people will forgive or be willing to look aside from those other places where maybe you're not excelling at. So like people are willing to pay more for Apple's beauty and the sense of also prestige that it communicates to everybody that sees you using an Apple product in spite of the fact that you could buy something that functions just as well to do most of the things that you're needing to do because most people are just using a computer to browse the internet, process words. They're not they're not doing intricate design and in the things where maybe Apple starts to really shine on a technology perspective. They're willing to spend more because of those differentiators. And so that's also very interesting where I think a lot of brands feel like they always have to be the cheapest. And really, one of the only reasons that Walmart is able to have that be a central differentiator for them is because they are so massive and they have the ability to influence price in that way and to say, you know, hey, if you want to come sell at our store, we need you to be setting your product at this price. And if you're a small brand and you're trying to make price your differentiator, What's going to allow you to outcompete the manufacturers that are going to be selling that product now or in the future? So that's a pretty difficult to def defend differentiator. But you don't necessarily have to be the cheapest if you are offering customers uh, one or two or three of these other differentiators that are really important to them. So like ease, you know, people are going to be willing to spend more money for something that is easy to use. 
people are willing to overlook um, function if it's sustainable, if sustainability is really important to them and the impact on the environment of a product is their like top line value, they may be willing to use something that doesn't do as good of a job because it is more uh, environmentally friendly. So that's also just a really interesting place to kind of spend some time thinking when it can feel scary to lean too far into one or two of those areas, you also gain a little bit of freedom in some ways in doing those things if you really commit to and uphold those differentiators that you are choosing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's true, right? And it's aligned with everything. Like you mentioned, you know, Louis Vuitton is not selling the cheapest bags. They're selling quality and luxury and beauty. Like they're selling all these other things that allow them to charge that higher price point and uh, yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. I added a couple more as you were talking, so I'll continue to add to that list um, as we go. <laughs> so thank you for that. Absolutely. Well, Emma, I would love to have you on again sometime to continue down this rabbit hole of like what I would love to do and what I what I have lo- I've loved this whole conversation so far. But one thing I've loved is diving into all these specific examples and pointing out what's working for for different brands. And it'd be fun to do another episode where all we do is just bring a ton of case studies of different brands of what's worked, what hasn't worked. But this episode is coming to a close. So we had one additional question for you, um, which is, and, and yeah, to kind of bring things home, what is the biggest lesson that took you way too long to learn that you wished you would have learned sooner? So... I'm going to get a little bit uh, open in a way that feels like in some ways a bit of a stark contrast to the rest of this conversation, but it's actually a lesson that I am currently learning right now. And the lesson is essentially that, and I really, okay, I haven't really articulated this before. So if it doesn't make sense or if it makes me sound like a jerk, then Uh, please don't hate me. But (laughs) but essentially, I'm learning that a lot of times you have to be bad at something if you want to be good at something. Mm. And that you have to embrace that period of being bad at it if you really want to excel at it. I think the reason why this is such an important lesson is because we're all going to naturally gravitate towards things that we are good at but just because we are naturally good at them doesn't always mean that that's the only area to be focusing our energy on and so we can get a little bit too focused on investing all of our time there in a way that perhaps Um, gives us a justification in why we might not have to do these other things. And in reality, it, you can't be good at everything off the bat. I'm, I'm saying, saying this mostly as a message to myself. I like things, a lot of things that I have done in life have come more naturally to me, but like what I'm referring to more specifically right now. And I feel like I'm just talking in circles at this stage is um, I recently started a YouTube channel. And that is not only something that I am very much learning as I go and and figuring out how to be bad at something, but I'm also figuring out how to be bad at something until I can be better at it in a very public way, which is hard. And that's also what we have to do in business because if you're ever going to launch something, you're not going to have all of the skills that you need to do. And you're not going to have your customer perfectly dialed in and your branding expertly figured out. Even if you have a huge budget behind you, there are probably going to be things that are going to evolve and change as you grow and develop in your business. And so at some point, you just kind of need to say, okay, I know the I know how to do the best I can. And the only way that I can continue learning is by doing this thing and learning as I go. And so, yeah, that's that's my lesson. Love it. Awesome. 
And uh, Emma, where's the best place for people to get in touch with you if they want to? You got a YouTube channel. Where else? Where, what's the best way for, for those who want to connect with you to, to do that? Marketingbyemma.com is our website and we have all of our all of the content me- con- contact methods there. So whether you prefer WhatsApp or phone call or email, you'll be able to find all of that there. We'd love to connect and geek out more about branding or explore how we can help you create your product pages or your website copy or any anything that you need a hand with. Awesome. And we'll drop awesome. those in the show notes so people can grab it. Andrew, you're going to send us out? Definitely go check out her YouTube channel. I was checking it out earlier today in preparation for this call. Uh, it's got some really great content over there. You're going to love checking out more. If you like this episode, you're going to love her YouTube channel. So check that out. Um, and that's it from us, guys. Uh, we'll see you next time on That Amazon Ads Podcast. See ya. Just-